Hey, Liron here. In today's video, we're gonna learn how to avoid mud and create a pleasing color harmony very easily. You can do it. Let's get to it. So let's get started with the process. There's actually a lot I want to go over, uh, but we'll go at it one step at a time as I accompany you through the process. So first off notice, I have two reference photos. One is the colorful version, one is black and white. I often do that because it really helps me to better see all the different components. Number one, values, which is probably the most important component for realism. And then number two, colors. The value can be very confusing to see in the colored version. So how dark or light something is, sometimes it's very hard to tell because a vibrant color can throw you off. So having both really helps. Now I will mention one more thing before we move on. I actually printed the reference photo, which you will see later on. That's much better than than a monitor. We're going to talk a bit about that soon. So here I am drawing the scene. I did not change the composition at all. This is often what I'll do when I just want to practice technique. It's not necessarily meant to be the best painting I paint, but all I want to do is apply myself. So I'll usually find a good photo to begin with, one that I like and I don't have to think too much and just paint it as is, uh, which is what I'm doing now. So I'm establishing the large shapes and this will really guide us through the painting process. What are the main shapes here? We have the sky, then we have basically two layers of ground, one which is, which is the farther mountains and one that's the foreground kind of field, right? In the middle, we have that cabin. Next to it, we have a tall tree. And then that's pretty much it. There are some cast shadows in the foreground. You want to get those too, because they can really help you, uh, say, establish a sense of depth and give it some kind of an extra interest and movement and some things in the foreground to focus on. So I do indicate some of those. And then here and there a few touches. And with that, we're ready to paint. So this is hot press paper. The thing with hot press paper is it's very unforgiving when it comes to flow. So you have to really use a lot of wet paint and mix in advance and all of those good stuff. What I actually did was spray before I started this wash and only then am I applying paint. It didn't wet everything, but I just wet it enough to help me with the flow. Now, first wash. All I'm doing is establishing temperatures. What do I mean by that? What's cool? What's warm? The sky is kind of cool. So I'm using a blue, a very neutral blue. We're going to talk about colors in just one second. And then the ground is warmer, much, much warmer. The cabin is warmer. So here I'm starting to use blue, uh, yellows and reds, right? Now the colors I'm using just real fast are French ultramarine, a bit of thalo blue. I'm using pyrrole scarlet and I'm using uh, um, yellow ochre. So these are pretty much the only colors I use. Later, you'll see me use a bit of sap green. So that adds up to like five colors, right? So that's not a lot of colors and there's a purpose for that. And that's the key point of this video. Okay, so let's uh, dive deeper. I'm going to do a bit of wet and wet here in the far one. So let's dive deeper into what it means to achieve a pleasing color harmony and to avoid mud. There are several levels of success I find when it comes to colors. One is to just have the painting look good or let's say not look bad, which is something that I struggled with a lot. The colors would seem off. They just don't work or you just end up mixing a lot of grays and awkward colors that don't work well together. Okay. And I'm starting the sky wash, still thin paint to help it flow because this is hot press paper. We want to get good flow. We want to prioritize flow over everything. Okay. So that's the kind of first level of success, just getting the colors not to look bad. Now, the next level is to actually get the colors work in the context of the full painting, work perfectly with the story you're trying to tell. So they work perfectly with your values, with your shapes, with everything. They help you direct the viewer's attention to the focal point. They, they work in harmony with the rest of the fundamentals of painting, which is values, shapes, edges, you know, all of those good stuff, just the basics. Now reaching that second level of success is a challenge. Okay. And that's something that I want you to be aware of. It's going to take some time. So what can we do? to at least have the painting look good in terms of colors. The number one advice I can give you is to use a total of fewer colors. 
don't go beyond four to five. What I like to do is have three primary colors, blue, yellow, and red, and then maybe have another primary version. So here I have French ultramarine for warmer blues and phthalo blue for cooler blues. But that's about it. I don't have two reds here. I just have my uh, pyrrole scarlet. I have one yellow, yellow ochre. That's the only colors I use. And then one supplemental color, which is the sap green that you're gonna see me use soon, okay? So that's a total of what, five colors? That's the number one thing you do. Just drop everything, throw, move aside all the rest of the paints, choose just five, go with those. Now here's one advice that I don't talk about as much, but is still very important, okay? When you mix those colors together, try not to mix more than two colors, unless you really know what you're doing. So let me explain. This shadow that I just mixed for the cabin has three colors in it. In fact, it's a gray. So I used both blue, both yellow and red. But generally speaking, try having most of your mixes composed of only two colors. And the third one is optional. So use your yellow and red to mix an orange, use your blue and yellow to mix, a, you know, all of that, and then maybe treat that third color as a muting mechanism. But don't go overboard with this, okay? Because the more you mix, the more colors you put into the mix, the messier it gets. So right now I have this muted orange, right? So I'm using um, a bit of my red, a bit of my yellow, and just a tiny bit of blue. And that's the magic, okay? For the colors you want to be bright and you want to show well, don't mix more than two colors. So for example, that rooftop, look at how much red and yellow there is on the right side where I want it to be bright. Just red and yellow, no blue almost. On the wall that you're gonna see me paint in just one second, you can be sure I'm using mostly yellow. Okay, for those light parts that you want to show, that you want to preserve the color, only mix two. This is incredibly important. Save those three color mixes to darker shadows, to elements that are more in the background, like those fields that are in the background, a little muted green, and that's how you make it work. Okay, that's one of the key advice I can give you. Look at that yellow I'm doing right now. It has a bit of red in it, but it's mostly yellow, a bit of red and zero blue. Okay. So that's important. Um, now, again, you, I talked about, I covered my own paintings. Let's talk a bit about the printed photo. Okay. Because that's one thing that is also incredibly important for the longest time. And by the way, look at how I let the wall merge with the rooftop. First stages, we allow for a bit of flow that, that always looks good and helps the painting look looser. We can always get the actual details later on and, and break that flow where we want to, but it's very hard, near impossible to get flow back once you break it. Okay, now here I am putting the background uh, uh, wash of the ground. So I told you this is more in the background, it's darker, I can mix more than two paints. But in fact, I have a very simple mix here. It's my uh, ultramarine or French ultramarine, and a bit of the uh, pyrrole scarlet. And that creates a very muted kind of blue, maybe it has a touch of yellow and a bit of thalo, thalo blue. Okay, that's a mix where I allow myself a bit more freedom when I mix. And the way I do this is First, I mix a green with the blue and yellow, and then I add a bit of red to neutralize it. And that sends it to the background and preserves the balance, right? So right now we have slightly brighter colors in the foreground and a bit of a more muted color in the background. Now you will see that as soon as I add those foreground colors and I'm gonna make the grass green, golden, nice bright color, you will see how it puts everything in the right context for the painting, okay? But for now I'm putting those mid kind of dark washes, but there, there will be a lot of work done. Now one more thing I wanted to talk about, yes, the printed photo and sorry about the ambulance, that's always how it is in the city. Um, I love, I've been for the longest time painting from my monitor. That's a terrible way to go about it. Uh, so I started really in the last two years to print a lot of my photos because that allows you to use the physical color uh, color um, swatcher. And I have a few videos on color matching. Just search the channel, you'll find them uh, and, and physically see the color. On the monitor, you're running into the problem of your screen is brighter than the paper. So you can never judge the value cleanly. Okay, 
So you want to print the photo. That's very important. Now let's get back to some of these stages of the process. I'm working the front of the painting. And what do I want there? Brighter colors. How do I get those brighter colors? I mix a maximum of two colors. So what you see me doing here is mostly sap green and a bit of So that's a premix green, right? And a bit of that yellow ochre. And I kind of alternate between them. And that's how I create this uh, effect of slowly going into more of a golden grassy kind of feel. Okay, and I'm going to do a bit of wet and wet. Now, I want to talk a bit more uh, about that point. I'm sorry, I'm sure my phone was on mute. Um, about that point of working in glazes. My entire approach for this process, you may notice it's a little more relaxed than my uh, maybe older processes. What I'm trying to do is work more in uh, thin washes that slowly and carefully build up. Uh, the painting. So instead of hurrying to the darks, I'm letting things build up in washes. Uh, and what I noticed is if you glaze a few layers of, let's say, a green, it will actually compound and make the green look sometimes stronger and prettier. So that can work for nice transparent colors. Uh, so I'm in a less of a hurry to go really extreme on the on the values and I'm rather pushing it slowly. Yes, I am doing wet and wet as you can see here, but I'm still keeping things fairly light. Okay. Now, you may look at this now and, and tell yourself this looks lost. This looks weird. And to be honest with you while painting this and looking at the foreground, I asked myself, did I mess this up? But then there was an, another voice in me that is like, I'm used to this. I'm so used to how this works and I know I haven't messed it up and I know that when I put in the final values and final colors, everything is going to fall in the right place. So have faith in yourself. Things will work out as long as you try hard and you really try and match the colors properly, match the values properly. There's no reason for things not to work. Okay. Now, as I'm painting this tree, I'm going to do wet and wet for the shadows. Notice how some of the branches and leaves and everything that's behind is a little darker. It's in the shadow. The best way to avoid overwork is to put down a shape for all of the leaves and then to do wet and wet within that shape to bring out the shadowy areas. That way they blend together and you don't get a bunch of overwork, which is something so many people suffer from, especially with foliage. That's one of the things I see all the time of trying to paint every branch, every grass blade, every leaf. And it always ends up with a lot of trouble. So don't do that. Okay, now look at what I'm doing here. I'm stretching that shadow from the tree onto the ground and I'm starting to establish some of the slightly darker shadows. And in fact, we're going to jump in just one moment to the shadow on the right side of the building, which is going to be a pretty prominent one um, and pretty important one uh, on, on the actual uh, cabin itself. But for now, I'm trying to establish those shapes by painting around them with that kind of a mid value. This, these things are still light, right? This is, this is not going to be dark at all. It's going to dry lighter and it's going to still look transparent and nice and golden. Uh, we're building it step by step. Um, so yeah, and I'm starting to mix some more paint uh, that is muted because I'm going to use it for some of the more muted areas on the shadow on the tree. And I'm actually going to do something I don't do often is I'm going to take a quick break to talk to you about my courses. Hey, what's up? Mid video Liron here. Just wanted to remind you that if you want to learn how to paint like this, be sure to check out the frustration free watercolor course and watercolor realism course. Both links in the description box below. Learn to let go, enjoy the painting process and get the realistic result you're after. So back to the process and let's put that shadow uh, onto the right side of the building. Notice how things started drying a little, which is good. It starts to put it in the context. Uh, and by the way, if you feel like you messed up, just take a break from the painting. Nothing happened. Give it a few hours, revisit it later. I assure you things will work out for the better this way. But in any case, we can move on. So here's what I'm doing here. Notice how parts of that shadow are darker than others. I like to get it done in one go. So first I'm using this a little lighter wash. That you, it looks dark because it's a small shape, but it's quite light. And as it starts to dry, what you'll see me do is slowly introduce slightly darker paint and painting it wet and wet. Um, and some parts of it dried, so I kind of missed the wet and wet boat. Some parts of it are still wet. That's fine. You can always introduce water back as long as it's not starting to get to that critical dry stage and bring back 
um, the some light areas if you want to. But one more thing that is still key is connections. So notice how from that shadow I immediately move forward with the connection to the darker piece of land that's to the right. Now the reason this piece of land is darker is because it's in the shadow of the cabin itself, I believe, uh, and possibly the tree. But here's the thing. I don't care as much about the reason. What I care more about is what it looks like. And a lot of you have been emailing me and messaging me and commenting that you're having a hard time to paint things as they appear and you tend to paint them as you think they appear. This is where that reference photo on the right comes into play. So can you see the black and white photo? How much easier it is to track the values on that photo instead of the photo on the left. So look at how I'm following those shapes of shadows I'm seeing there almost to the T and really establishing them as one unified big shape of shadow. Okay, now it's hard to do all of this simult simultaneously with color mixing, which is why I always recommend beginners to start black and white. But let's say you're past that stage, now we're talking colors. So now we have to know the right color we mix and make sure it's the right value. It's dark enough, light enough, etc. Okay, and what I'm doing right now is it is a one notch darker, but it's still not fully black. Things are still going to feel transparent and beautiful and, and full of life. Okay, it's not going to be dead kind of matte finish which is important for me recently. Um, and every shape I do here, look at how I connect it to some other details. Even if there aren't any details, they're all connected just to keep the movement, to keep the flow going, to keep it as, as a part of a bigger group of shapes, okay? So one thing you wanna be aware of is the shape you're painting as well. Again, you saw me following those shadows based on the black and white photo that, that is always in front of me. And I match from that as well, the values using my um, viewfinder. Uh, and again, you can watch a few videos I have on color matching. Um, but the overall process is let's mix the right color and then let's make sure it's the right value too. Now look at what I'm doing here. I'm glazing with another layer of green. This is crucial because the foreground needs to be pushed a bit to be green. Now this is sap green and yellow ochre. Once again, I told you slow glazes, gradually adding will actually compound and make it look good. Okay, now I'm doing this fun little <laughs> dance where I'm just picking up a bunch of water from my water bucket and flicking it around the painting to create a texture of grass. I'm doing this in a very gentle manner. I'm not going overboard with it. I just want to bring out a bit of that dotted pattern that can hint at different blades of grass catching the light and so on. And what I'm doing now is coming back with a thin wet brush onto the paint that is starting to be maybe 50% wet, uh, dry or wet, it doesn't matter, right? Maybe it's going beyond 50% dry. So it's moving towards the 60% dry. And I'm just touching, I'm touching different areas and look at the effect it created. By introducing water, it left those light marks in there. This is something I don't do much of, but I intuitively know it will bring water into the wash, make it lighter and so on. So sometimes I'll catch myself doing things just out of intuition, because I know how water to paint ratio works and all of that and timing which is very important these are things you want to practice till they become second nature now we're starting to put that shadow in the foreground but what's very important for this shadow not to feel detached from the rest of the scene is to control its edges and to blend some of them in so what you'll see me do is not only paint those long beautiful stretching shadows but also muting some of the uh edges of the shadows just to keep them connected to the rest of the patches of grass if you will now one more thing is again i'm doing these little dotted um or jagged or you know dashed lines just to bring in an effect of maybe areas that catch a shadow or catch you know just random details that comes with experience it's not as easy to do um but you see me putting those dots here and there and that establishes the feeling of grass just a bit of it it's not nothing too extreme but just a bit of that feeling of grass now if you just close your eyes for a few seconds and open them again or look at this video with fresh eyes you'll see that the colors are already darn beautiful like i really like the color harmony we created here so the only thing that's really left is to put in the rest of the shadows that are left and then a few details and those details come in the form of both dark details like the shadow under the rooftop and the, the texture of the planks of wood on the front wall of the cabin but also in the form of opaque light paint that's going to be just 
you know, John Brilliant straight out of the tube. One of my favorite opaque paints to use to get some details in uh, to bring back highlights because it's a warm white color. And all of my tools and supplies are in the description box. You can find everything I'm using there. Um, I actually think the John Brilliant tube isn't there because I can't find it on Amazon, but I will, I think I will add it. I'm going to write a note to myself just to mention it because many people will be looking for it. Um, so yeah, starting with the dark details. First thing that pops to my mind, and you know, people sometimes say, I don't know where to start or where to continue or there is no clear cut answer for these things. It's more about what do you want? The thing that popped for me is those details of the roof. And the, and the wooden texture. So that's what I'm tackling first. Sometimes tackling the area that's, that's most, you know, you see the most of, or it looks to you like an important area, will just put you in a good spot because then um, it puts the entire painting in the right context and you know, oh crap, I need to add more details to the rest or, oh, I need to darken this area because once I darken this, it looks too light. You know, start with the thing that pops most for you. You've seen me throughout this process working on small areas in multiple layers. So you have the freedom, not everything has to be connected, right? I do try to connect things that are proximate to one another and have similar value, but not everything has to be connected. The sky I painted separately, right? The ground I painted separately. Those mid kind of hills that are a little more muted I painted separately, right? Now look at how this shadow on the rooftop really makes it pop. So now things are starting to fall into place. When you establish the, the approximate colors and you push the values to be right, so the, the darks are dark enough, the lights are light enough, things tend to work out. And if we go back to the entire point of this tutorial, and right now what I'm doing is drawing with opaque paint, that's basically it. Dipping it straight into the tube or mixing just a bit of it on the palette and drawing that fence that catches the light and is very beautiful. These are just final touches. The reason the painting looks good is because we did a good job so far, not because of these details. These details just give the viewer a bit more things to look at, right? But going back to the point of this video, how do you create a pleasing to the eye harmony and avoid mud? The way you do this is by using fewer colors, by being slower and more careful with matching the colors you see, right? If you really look at that red and you try to mix that, and I didn't do a perfect job at it, and I, and I, I changed some things, I simplified some things, right? But overall, just generally speaking, if you try and match the color you see and be approximate with it, you really, you match it. You print the photo and you match it on your desk physically, which makes it much, much easier to see. So you see that it's not a pure red, but it's actually a brown. And this thing in the background is not a strong green. It's a gray that has a bit of green qualities to it, right? If you do that, you will get like 80% close, 70% close. And that's more than good enough for the colors to look good, okay? Forget about those 24 color palettes. I've used them before and I will continue using them from time to time, but for the most part, you only need three primary colors. And if you use those, every single color you're mi you'll mix out of those will look good, will look harmonious, will look like it's it belongs, right? Now, you can mess it up even with three colors. If you mix more than two, again, all the time, and you end up with a bunch of browns and grays that don't relate to one another in a, an overarching pattern, and that's something I will talk about in the future, overarching color pattern, um, then you can still mess it up, especially with those grays, because if you look at someone like uh, Joseph Zbukovic, yeah, he uses a lot of those, but he still has an overarching plan. So what's my overarching plan here? The sky is a blue, the roof is red, the foreground has a lot of green to it, the, the mid layers of, of ground, the hills, in the distance are a little muted. There is an overarching pattern here. But if you look at the colors individually, I challenge you to sample them and you'll see they're not bright. They're not strongly saturated. All of them almost are a bit muted at the very least, okay? So it's two colors dominant and then another extra color. And as long as you follow that pattern and you always have at least two colors dominant and the third one is just a supportive role, you will do a good job. But it all starts with the fundamentals, like work correctly. Print the reference photo, 
properly look at the colors and try and match them, match the values, have two versions, black and white and colorful, right? And that will help you move forward. I hope this helps. Here's the final result. Here it is up close. I really like the details and how they turned out this time. Uh, I even didn't include a lot of the details in the background, right? I'm going to show you also a, sc uh, a scanned version that looks much better and shows the colors much, much better. Um, so this is it. Uh, I really hope you enjoyed this one. Now let's uh, wrap it up. So thank you so, so much for watching. I hope once again, you found this useful and don't forget if you want to learn how to paint like this, how to let go and enjoy the painting process, be sure to check out the frustration free watercolor course, or if you want to achieve realism, which a lot of elements of it are here for sure. Be sure to check out the watercolor realism course. So many of you are in the frustration free watercolor course, but not yet in the watercolor realism course. So I do hope you'll join. I want to thank you so, so much. And I will see you in the next video.